Our hypothesis is this. You have good positions and mechanics, fantastic. Can you do it under speed? Can you do it under load? Can you do it under cardiorespiratory demand? Can you do it under stress, right? That's really why we're training here. Hey, here's our central concept. Let's introduce a stimulus that makes that difficult. And ultimately, that's one of the ways that we can challenge intensity. That's actually how we're using intensity, right? By changing load, by changing volume. Those are intensity ways, even adding speed, are ways that we can challenge the robustness of position. And of course, you're gonna get all the physiology out of that, but I'm interested in the coordination. I'm interested in the stability of these things. So check this out. Uh, simple test that we've been doing a long time kind of highlights are thinking about why we categorize movements in the way we do. And category one movements usually have, we describe them as having very stable start positions, moving to a very stable second position. And they can be done slow, and of course they can be done explosively, but if you look at sort of the classic strength and conditioning, back squat, front squat, strict pull up, um, you know, deadlift, bench, all of these are category one movements. They teach us how to be stable, to be well connected through and back up. But what you'll see is in the gym, we add speed to a lot of these things. So a category one air squat, I'm just in a squat width that's fine. It's a body weight squat. I'm gonna let myself hinge forward. My foot pressure is gonna stay the same. There's my bottom position of my squat and I come back up. And what I want you to appreciate here is that my foot pressure remained the same. So I was from the ball of the foot to the heel was constant, I didn't wobble around, and my ankles stayed in the middle of my feet. So I was in an organized position when I started, there's my reference position, and again, I can make that a more of a front squat, right? I can make that more of a back squat, air squat, athletic squat, right? But the idea is my foot pressure doesn't change, stays constant, okay? So, great, category one. Well, category two then would be adding some speed to that which is why we love swings and kettlebells, and we love, same thing, and we love power cleans, and adding some of these push press speed-like movements. So all of a sudden, if I have to take away some of that connection, can I find that speed again, right? Because now this starts to look like sport. This starts to approximate the needs to be able to move quickly and still have access to my positions. So suddenly, if I just drop, can I maintain that foot pressure in the bottom, right? Instantaneously, can I, can I grab that foot pressure? Right, this is one of the reasons that a power clean is so good, so we're teaching our athletes to be able to stop, but also have that same organized position work. So if I start to see massive deviations in the organization of my athlete under speed load, I'm thinking to myself, ah, I have an incomplete pattern, no problem. Category three movements, or suddenly when we're changing direction in the middle of the movement. So we lose a lot of connectivity here. So this jumping up from the ground is a great category three movement test because I'm having to open the hips from a bad position, right, and close the hips and land and be organized, which is what Olympic lifting is or a lot of sport. I have to change direction, I have to change. But what we see as we add speed and as I keep coming back to this foot pressure idea, is that the more complex the skill, the more able I am to elicit a compensation response. Which means, if I add speed, I'm likely to get to the bottom of the problem. So I can't say that your shoulder is a healthy, perfect shoulder until you can press, push press, and jerk. Can you lengthen and go from open chain to closed chain back to open chain again? Or go from closed chain to open chain to closed chain, right? So all of a sudden, I need to see that you can stabilize not only in this direction, but also from this direction. And those are movements that help us elicit understanding about what's going on with the athlete. So making the, the task more and more difficult. Look, I don't care if you need jerking has anything to do with your sport, but that ability to add load and control from both sides does matter, right? That's what we're looking for is, is, is competency, is mastery in these movements. So if I jump up from the ground, right, I can jump really high in this position, but I ultimately, I'm interested in can I land in this bottom position and, and still have the same organization at the top, right? So this bottom test suddenly becomes really interesting because people are like, look, my ankle range of motion is great. I'm like, great, show me that you still have that dynamic ankle range of motion, super control when you're going fast. And just jumping up from the ground, I mean, of course, 
you can jump up pretty high, but I'm looking for that skill. How fast was my athlete able to get back to her feet? How quickly, if we added a wall ball, and all of a sudden I'm decelerating, whew, that's not necessarily category one all of a sudden, right? That speed elements in there is how we're challenged positions. And remember, the way to challenge range of motion is to begin to add those speed and complexity because you cannot hide your true range of motion expressed through your motor control at speed unless you're complete. So understand, faster you're moving, the more likely we're able to make mistakes. And that may be motor control, movement control, or it may be range of motion. So again, it's easier to slow people down to get better control, and we really want to see who you are when you're going fast. Hopefully that helps.